Going. Yep. We're on. Okay, good. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, appreciate you joining us. Hopefully there's some people who are with us. <laughs> live on oh, Facebook, it kind of looks like that. We're not absolutely sure, but um, I'll uh, tell everybody who's been on for our social time to turn your ga gallery view at the top right of your screen off um, and switch it to uh, pre presenter, uh, present speaker view, sorry, for speaker view. And that way, when the, the slides start, you'll have a way better uh, look at the, the uh, slides. All of your mics are now muted, so we can't hear you. So um, if you have comments or questions as we go along, just type them in the chat, which is at the middle of your bottom menu bar. Uh, so that's a little bit of housekeeping. And one, one more reminder, please. Oh. Okay, Malia froze. <laughs> oh, Malia, you were frozen. You were frozen. <laughs> Raise when your hand if Malia was frozen. I was frozen. That's so weird. You were frozen, Malia. I'm still on five G. Because you were frozen. To you, I look frozen, but I think it was you. Okay. Well, why don't you right. head on? I'm going to start the show. If for some reason uh, Malia gets quiet again or frozen, I will hopefully just be able to keep going. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Okay, can you see the screen? All right. Well, welcome everybody. This is our little pre-show that we're gonna have before Kate begins her talk. So tonight we're here to see, um, hear from Kate. Kate Sutherland works for Seabirding Pelagics and she's gonna talk about the cacao. Um, that is the nickname for the Bermuda petrel, and we're really looking forward to that. I'm going to share I, some pictures. <clears throat> Go ahead, Malia. I was just going to say, am I still frozen or am I okay? No, you're good. Okay. Go, go for it. Um, so we're going to share some pictures from our uh, members. These are some local rarities. Um, Steve Coggin took this fun photograph there on the bottom right, the white pelican uh, having a little encounter with a, a cormorant at High Rock Dam in, in Rowan County. Um, Patty got a picture of a lesser black bag gull uh, from a couple of weeks ago, I think that was on Lake Norman. And Patty also shared with us her picture of the greater white fronted geese on Stillwell Lake. I think they were there for a couple of days and, and many of our members got out there to see that, which is pretty cool. All right, Martina's bird. I don't know if Martina wants to pop in. Sorry, I should have given her a heads up, but this is uh, her brewer's blackbird, which was um, is very unusual for the state. I don't, I'm not exactly sure how many records there are, but not many. Um, so hanging out in some cattle fields, Malia, I don't know, you went to go see it. Yeah, it's, um, it's off. So I put the exact pin on eBird that you can, the coordinates, but uh, it's hanging out in a cattle pasture among the cow patties as they are as they tend to do. So um, I know a couple of people got to see him a couple of days ago and I would imagine he's still around. Um, and he would he, just walk around in the field, sometimes perch up. Um, so I got actually, he was singing a few times, which was a real treat. Um, mm -hmm. It's a terrible song, but it's a real treat anyway. <laughs> um, How does he stand out? How do you know him from other blackbirds that could be in the area? So it's definitely a trickier ID. Um, when you're out there, he's the only blackbird in the field. Usually there might be cowbirds, but um, of course the yellow eye is pretty different. Um, the, from telling it apart from a rusty blackbird, um, it's got no rust edging, kind of a, it, this is not a great photo for it, but um, different shape. They're very dumpy with a small head. Um, okay. 
And from a grackle, you're looking for a shorter tail and a slender bill, but he's the only guy out there, only blackbird, so should be fine. If he could yeah. stay by himself, that'll help us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks. And Martina thinks in the in the chat, I mean, the social time, she said she thinks it's going to stay around. So anyone who still wants to try to get it, it pro probably will be there. So, yeah, I think a few people are going to go for it tomorrow is what I was at. Some people ask. So we'll see. Good, okay. good, good. So I don't think we've got John and Chris Hannah on, right, Christine? I, I didn't, see, didn't them see them pop come up, up so. unfortunately. Yeah, you can talk about all this fabulous stuff they've seen. Okay, yeah. So, um, you know, typically on our, our listserv, I try to put out a notification if people want to share some of their photos, whether it's a fun sighting in the backyard or something from a recent trip. Um, rarities, get extra points. That's really cool. Um, so I'm calling this one Hannah Palooza. They sent me some of their favorite shots from recent walks that they've taken here in Mecklenburg County and Lincoln County. Um, and they were just, a, it's a nice variety of shots. Nothing um, super rare, although the Western Tanager is pretty cool. That's, uh, you know, certainly unusual. Um, wood duck, a lot of you guys have been seeing wood duck lately. Uh, loggerhead shrike, AKA the butcher bird. That's one of my favorite birds. That's a, a nice shot there. And um, yellow belly sapsucker, a cool view of a vivid red under his chin there. So, is thank you a, for saying uh, that. Is that a bullock sorrel? Oh. They told me it was a Western tanager, but now that you're saying it. Yeah, I think that's a bullocks. I think that is a bullocks. Hmm. <laughs> I, you know, I was so busy putting together, that's, so a bunch of people sent me slides this time. Yeah, that's better than really a Western tanager. It. Yeah, you're right. You're you're right. Cool. Cool. Thank you, Matthew. Well, there you go. Yes. Thank you very much. We'll have to ask them where they saw it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do we do it? Let's start out and say, do, do we think that these are actually what they say they are? <laughs> some, kind of, <laughs> some kind of masqueraders yes, here. Yes, I think I got these right. This is what happens when I'm multitasking, trying to build yeah. a slideshow when I'm actually supposed to be working. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of season, FOS, for anyone who's not familiar with the acronym. Um, First of season migrants. So uh, go ahead, Malia. Oh, no, don't call on me. The white eyed vireo seems to be a popular one. Patty Maston got this on Six Mile Creek. We we also got it on Six Mile Creek. Mm -hmm. That was that was uh, Saturday. So there seemed to be quite a few of those out and about. And um, yeah. yeah, if you ever <laughs> want to see one, Six Mile Creek seems to be the place. I've never, that's the certainly where I see most of them a lot all you know all season long and all summer long they they that really seems to be their favorite place but that shot's just fantastic that white eye and the lighting i, I really like that shot. very nice and then the blue gray net catcher and then steve coggin you want to say anything about the osprey you would have to unmute yourself was that uh that's a great shot what what was it up to did it have a nest or any if you didn't see any of that right it was a pair down there and this one had a fish and just the look on his face like I will kill you if you come near my fish <laughs> what I thought well nice picture yeah I like that one this little torpedo all right some some more migrants Ooh, uh, ooh! I see the one I like the Louisiana water thrush um, yeah. that's very cool yeah you want and the palm warbler Chantilly. I've been seeing them over there a lot of the winter, but Martina, they they have not had the ones I've seen have not had that cap. So is that a is that a a, a breeding uh, plumage thing that comes on them, or am I just too blind to see it? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a breeding plumage thing. Um, okay, you can actually kind of see the back of the rusty cap here. Is not it's not fully in. It's still molting a little bit, but mm -hmm. um. A nice little Western palm warbler. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Very, very cool. Okay, very Christine, cute. go for the water thrush. This yeah. is exciting. Okay, so as um, Malia mentioned, we had a, a group walk, a, a, a Mecklenburg trip on Saturday. And um, early on, someone told us that they had a Louisiana water thrush way down at the end. 
um, and we were hoping for it. And we heard it calling a ways back, and uh, you know, it, it took a while, but eventually it did come closer, and we were happy to see it. And then it landed in a little bit of water um, alongside the edge there in that cul-de-sac, and was so cooperative. Really started um, putting on a show for us. So. Um, uh, this is a great shot that Gretchen took. I just love this shot because the, the reflection in the puddle is so pretty. Um, and I was able to get some video, so I'm going to show that to you now. So you can see, um, if you haven't seen one before or you haven't had a good look at it, um, and hopefully you can hear the sound. It really likes to bob his tail. Sure, if you were able to hear that. But we were pretty excited to see one first of the season. He gets a nice catch here at the end, too. Maybe biologist Steve can give us a clue. It's some, it kind of looks like a caterpillar, but I would think it would be too early for a big fat caterpillar. Not sure what that is, but so that was nice. We 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 really enjoyed that. That was sort of the end when we hit the end of the line there on Six Mile, and uh, it was cool to actually be able to watch his behavior and listen to him call and uh, get a close look. Cool, down. cool, very nice. Thank you, Christine. Sure. It's interesting that the video doesn't play real time. You know. Anyway, um, all right. So we are. Uh, uh, as we did last year, um, mass members are going out on Global Big Day, which is May 8th, and there's the web address if you want to find out more and participate in that. And Christine came up with this idea for a contest. So tell, tell us how that works, Christine. Sure. Um, so basically, we're just going to rely on the honor system and hope that people are encouraged to get out on the big day. And um, we thought we would just give out a prize for whoever sees the most species for the day. Um, and uh, we're saying within the membership area, so wherever you live or the nearby county, that you know, the counties that visit and are members with us. Um, so Matthew, you can't go to the coast and try to win. You have to stay, have to stay I, nearby. I am actually gonna be out, out in the uh, Gulf Stream with Kate. Um, ah, maybe, so. Well, yeah, so those don't count. This <laughs> okay. is going to be for mass members who are staying local. Um, and so if you're doing backyard birding and, and maybe want to try to get to a few hot spots too, that's probably the, the best way to get ahead on, the, on this day. And I would just encourage you to eBird or keep a list however you normally do. And if you would just email me at chrismcburder at yahoo.com, I will um, collect the numbers from everybody and we can announce it at the at the May meeting. Um, but we have um, bluebird nest boxes and we also have a brown headed nuthatch nest box. So um, you could win box of your choice if you see the most species on uh, next Saturday, not this Saturday, next Saturday, May 8th. No, two Saturdays. Oh my God, it's May. A month. April. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, it's month. been a long day, everybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> In May. Okay, that so we'll remind you of the next meeting and then we'll have <laughs> to announce it afterwards. Okay. We Got none of now. us know what day or what week or what month <laughs> no, or what time it is, so don't worry about it. Yeah. All right. An update on the magic field, which those of you have gone out and seen all the cool sparrows and all on there. Unfortunately, um, uh, Matthew, you want to talk about this or you want me to talk about it? Or have you got too much? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I was out there a couple weeks ago and just, uh, I've been going out there a lot this year and uh, you know, they, they've had security that have kind of rolled by and, and parked near my car. I don't know if they've been making sure I'm not doing anything nefarious or anything, but uh, this, this time they actually like called me on the loud loudspeaker and had me come and talk to him and 
like, hey, you're trespassing, you can't be here. Um, but I got, I got some phone numbers for uh, the property managers and can reach out to them to uh, hopefully get, get some sort of access for like a big day count, uh, like the, the global big day, Christmas bird count, that type of thing. So hopefully it won't be completely off limits, but uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't have high hopes. Uh, yeah. they, they said they were going to be putting up, they, they had ordered no trespassing signs and uh, you know, those will go up as soon as they get them, I'm sure. So. Sounds good. Thank you, Matthew. We'll, uh, we were lucky to be able to, to go there while, while we could. So we'll see what happens from here, but we just wanted people to know so they wouldn't be surprised when they went out. Yeah. You know, I would love to offer free bail to members, but I don't think we have that budget. So don't get yourself in trouble. That's all I'll say. All right. Some bad news to some good news. Let's get some updating on the leaderboard. Um, so um, I love this picture that, uh, that Melissa sent in of her bluebird. So I, I noticed that she moved up in the count. So she must be bribing her birds with, uh, with these lovely mealworms and that uh, bluebird is, looks, looks pretty happy and healthy. So uh, you gotta do what you can to get them in. So, so the, 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 the challenge is heating up still. It's, I, I love to see that everybody's still doing so well and, uh, and keeping at it. I think for many of us, there was sort of a, a lull there, but now, now we're getting into the start of spring migration and hopefully the numbers will, will keep coming up. So um, we saw Strummer on the call earlier. He's still in the lead. He's really, uh, he's really spending a lot of time looking around his yard. He's doing really well with 66 and he's our overall leader. Um, Gretchen recently moved into second place with 60. Jeannie's got 59. Wayne and Martina are tied in fourth place with 57 species. And Steve, Ron, and Melissa, Steve Tracy, um, they've got 56. So it's a real tight race for that second place. And, and we'll see with, um, with migration, how, how, the, how the places switch and who, who does well with warblers, I think will be key. Um, I think we all should be a little nervous. Martina and Ron, uh, the, the big guns are obviously uh, come to play now. So, <laughs> well, yes, what's that? Somebody must have had their microphone oh, on. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I'm glad to see everybody's doing so well and a few new names. Um, so um, Steve is in uh, Rowan County. He's got 49. Gretchen is in the lead in York, 60. For Union County, it's Martina. In Cabarrus County, um, Renee, Kim, Kim Ray is still holding the lead. She's got 53. As we mentioned, we've got that three-way tie in Gaston County and Strummer is our overall leader and so therefore is leading in Mecklenburg. So I'm, I'm, it's great to see everyone so active. It's great to see those numbers starting to pick up again. It will be uh, really cool to see how this keeps going for the rest of the year and, and uh, where we end up for December. And the big winner on January 1st. Okay. Watch out for Martina. She's got that... Uh that microphone she's rigging up That's right. for, for her, no, yeah, for her nocturnal she's flight recording counts. Birds. Maybe she's going to play lowers and try to get them in there. Well, it's, I considered it, but I might only count just birds that I actually physically see. <laughs> Sounds All good. Right. Sounds good. All right. I don't so know if we is, really need to elaborate on this too much, Christine. It's no, just, no, uh, I mean, you, quickly. You guys, no, we were, we, I think we were hoping to have a Zoom on this, but really the, the folks that are running the North Carolina Bird Atlas uh, have been providing some nice uh, Zoom videos already, some, some meetings. Um, so they've done Atlas 101, and this past Tuesday they did a Next Steps video. Um, if you haven't done it, you still can. This goes on for five years. Um, you don't have to commit to um, 
to taking a, a block and the full coverage if you don't want. You could still just learn about it. And basically any bird, any birding you do in, in North Carolina State, you can have your eBird set so that that data automatically goes to their portal and gets contributed to this particular citizen science project. So okay. um, go to ncbirdatlas.org and you can get more information. You can look at these videos um, and it will also tell you about how you can change your portal um, when you're online and you can also change it on your eBird on your phone app as well. It's, it's really easy and all the data that goes there also still goes to all your main eBird stats. Um, so I would just, it would be a, a, an easy, simple way to, to help out. And if you wanna learn more, have any questions, go to the site or you can ask one of us. We'd be happy to lead you to the right people. Okay, good, good. Thank you very much. I, you know, for, for beginners, that's a bit of a stretch, I think, but not necessarily. It just depends on how much in the weeds you wanna get. Um, so anyway, our next meeting is Painted Buntings. It will be on Thursday, May 6, right here in our speaker. Dr. Jamie Ruttenberg, who is an environmental ecologist and ornithologist at UNC Wilmington, and they are gorgeous birds. That's a great picture of a painted bunting, really nice. So we hope we'll see you again on May 6. But moving on to tonight, I'm gonna to call on Steve Coggin, our field trip coordinator. What are, what are we headed to see migration-wise this uh, month, Steve? Oh, we have a lot going on, Malia. You do, I know you do. We have a lot do. of things scheduled and the birds are coming. Okay, yeah. we got a slideshow that lists all the trips, but basically, make birds. What? I think there might be one coming up. Yeah, yeah. basically, they're all on mechbirds.org. For those of you who are fairly new, they're all listed and whatever. So there it is. Go ahead, Steve. Well, we're uh, continuing to recognize the COVID pandemic is still going on. This little cartoon here is hilarious. <laughs> it's got this birder who's inhaling and she can see because her glasses aren't fogged but when she exhales she's fogged up or her binoculars are fogged up yeah it's but tough. one of the steps we've taken <laughs> is to limit the number of people we take on walks and so you have to register with your trip leader and they will all keep a wait list here are a few of the trips coming up uh the one on saturday at catawba college is full right Sorry, sorry. <laughs> In the following week, we have three walks uh, at Colonel, ba uh, Colonel Francis Beatty Park, Torrance Creek Greenway, and the ever popular ribbon walk. And throughout April and May, we have more talk, more walks coming. And there'll be more added. Uh, the demand for this is really high, and we're trying to get more people to lead walks and get more people out there. So contact your trip leader. If it's full, get on a wait list. I contacted someone today from the wait list for Saturday. So it really does happen. And uh, keep checking the website. Thank you. So did you remind them, Steve, that if they sign up and register and can't go to make sure and let the leader know so that your spaces will be um, freed up for and that's some more burgers. So that was yeah, one I, little- I forgot one. to mention that, but- uh, <laughs> The trip leaders are taking this very seriously. So if you do decide not to go, give your place to somebody else on the wait list. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Um, so during the pandemic, more and more people have put bird feeders in their backyards and walked county greenways and started stretching their wings into the world of birding. And that's uh, been a good thing for us because unfortunately the, the past year's cabin fever has had an upside and we have a much bigger flock at Mecklenburg Audubon now. So there are some uh, uh, new members that I want to recognize tonight just by their first names. We have not one, but two new Sharons, Virginia, Ed, Chris, Kathy, Yvonne, Cindy, Jerome, <laughs> Beth, Elizabeth, <laughs> Catherine and Betsy. We're so glad to have all uh -oh. of you with us. Thank you so much. And if you're interested Amen. in joining Me Mecklenburg Audubon and you uh, are not a, a member so far, you just go to mechbirds.org and click on membership and you can join online. It's very cheap, $10 a year for an individual and $15 for a whole family. So that's my pitch. Moving on to our main event. Um, I'm gonna call on Matthew Withrow, 
and he is our board advocacy chair to introduce our fabulous speaker. Hey everybody, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, we are very happy to have Kate Sutherland with us this evening. Uh, for the past 20 years, she's been living in Hatteras, North Carolina, where she's worked as lead guide for Brian Pattison Seabirding, which if you don't know, is the premier pelagic birding outfit on the East Coast. Since 2016, she's helped run the Cahow Experience in Bermuda with Bob Flood. In 2019, she's, uh, she was a seabird observer on a research cruise out of Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and she's currently working on her master's in marine biology at UNC Wilmington. Kate is a phenomenal birder and always eager to share her enthusiasm with others. And on that note, I will go ahead and turn it over to her so we can get started. All right, thank you so much. And hopefully this is going to work for me. So I'm not sure if you guys can see that. Thumbs up. Okay, all right. Here we go. All right, so my talk this evening, can you all hear me okay? If you ever have any issues hearing or seeing anything, just type it in the comment box or let me know, interrupt me and let me know. Um, but my talk I prepared for you this evening is called The Fabled Cahau, Saving a Lazarus Species from Extinction. So the Cahau is the local name for the Bermuda petrel or Pteridroma Cahau. And a Lazarus species, for any of you who don't know, is a, a species that was thought to be extinct for a period of time and then is rediscovered. So they rise from the dead. So we'll start off pretty basic. Hopefully you can see my little arrow here. Um, the Bermuda petrel is in the order Procelariformes. These are the tube-nosed seabirds. So as you can see, this is a picture of a Bermuda petrel here, but as you can see, they have this structure on the top of their bill. Um, originally, it was thought that it was just for expelling salt. So since these birds spend their entire lives at sea, coming to land only to reproduce themselves. Of course, they're drinking salt water um, and they filter out the salt and then excrete it from these tubular nostrils on top of their bill. They kind of sneeze out like a brine solution. Um, but also lately, well, it, recently, um, they realize that they play a large role in olfaction. Um, so these birds, if you think about the way that we walk around and we're using visual cues, uh, these birds use their sense of smell in that same way. So we look at the ocean and it looks featureless to us, but in reality, it's a scent scape for them. So they can find food, they can find their way from place to place. They actually can also recognize their mates. Um, so, so it's a very important structure. We have a number of species offshore from North Carolina that some of you might recognize that are also in this order. Um, Wilson storm petrels come from the Southern Ocean. Um, you can see that tubular structure there on the bill. Uh, Great Shearwater is another one that we see fairly often offshore from North Carolina. And again, you can see that tube nose there. Uh, and the black cap petrel, which is like a cousin to the Bermuda petrel, they're in the same genus, uh, Pterodroma. Uh, again, you can see that tubular structure on top of the bill. So these birds are all species that spend their entire life at sea, um, as I mentioned, only coming to land to reproduce themselves. So we'll get started with Bermuda and just some basic identification about, you know, just some basic ID cues that we look for with Bermuda petrels. Um, and then we'll move on to the history of the species. So this is a map of Bermuda for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, Castle Harbor right here, this is the one location that Bermuda petrels are found and nesting currently. So this is a Bermuda petrel. It's a photograph that was taken in Bermuda. I do spend some time there looking at these birds. Um, so as you can see, they're a tube nose and a gadfly petrel. So they have these nice long wings um, some things that set them apart from gadfly petrels that we would see more commonly offshore from Hatteras. They have this nice hooded appearance. So they have sort of a dark eye patch and then this cowl that comes down around their neck. They also have a very dark leading edge in the underwing 
and a number of them have this dark thumbprint here. Another feature that you would be looking at when you're looking at them at C, it's not always really easy to pick out characteristics and check them off. Um, so you want to look at the body shape as well. These birds are very slender bodied and they have a nice long tail, which you can see uh, when you're observing them at sea. Um, this is a dorsal view of a Bermuda petrel. So you can see that sort of hooded appearance again. And this white above the bill does stand out. Some of them have, it's not super easy to see in this picture, but some of them will have a nice M pattern on their upper parts. And they also have a pale horseshoe shape white bar on their upper tail. Um, sometimes you can see that and sometimes you can't. So it's a really nice cue, um, but it's not something that you can expect to see on every individual that you might observe at sea. So these are some images of Bermuda petrels. Uh, two of them were taken offshore from Hatteras. This is sort of an, an unusual Bermuda petrel. It has a white collar, which is something that we would see on our more local black cap petrels. Um, but again, you can see it has this nice, so one of the things that, they, that you can see in the field also, they have a very nice, small, delicate bill and that sort of long tail. Of course, the tail feathers are pretty abraded there, so it doesn't look as long as it could, but, um, but yeah, we were able to identify that as a Bermuda petrel at sea. Um, I like to include this picture because of the date. A lot of people think uh, that we only see them in the spring, um, but we found this bird sitting on the water with a flock of petrels in September, which is pretty cool. So um, I wanted to use this photo to point out the shape of the body. Uh, so they look, to me, they look almost teardrop shaped. So they have this sort of chesty appearance and then moving back to that long tail. Um, so we'll look at a few more pictures that are fairly similar to that. Uh, another feature that you see with gadfly petrels is their wings are usually crooked when they're flying. So you see this sort of like sharp edge in the front. So it's sort of pointed, angled. Um, and when they're flying, they do fly on bowed wings. Uh, I wanted to, this isn't the best image, but it's a nice image to show the dorsal view and how sometimes it can be a little hard to see that white, but this one has a nice M pattern there. So uh, in each of these slides, I put the Bermuda petrels that we've already looked at in the corners for reference. Um, and a lot of people would say confusion species, black cap petrel, no way, but there are smaller uh, dark form black cap petrels that we see offshore here. And sometimes they can show that almost sort of like thick, um, dark collar as opposed to just a chest spur. So some of the typical black cap petrels we see um, don't show this sort of smudge there on the chest, but you can see this bird has a pretty big bill, even though it has that same sort of dark leading edge on the underwing and that thumbprint on the underwing. You can actually see in the back that it has that large white upper tail, which is a, makes some kind of like a flying field mark. Um, this is a picture of a Bermuda petrel for comparison. So remember I was talking about how they look a little bit chestier than the black head petrels. You can see that difference in shape there um, and also how small that bill looks in comparison with the black head petrel bill. Uh, this is that same individual. It's a dark form black cap petrel. Um, and when you look at this underwing, you can see that you could have some confusion there if you saw this bird quickly or you didn't see it very well, or maybe it was flying in towards you in bad light. Um, but as soon as they turn over and show you, give you that dorsal view, you can see that they have this white upper tail. Black cap petrels have an entirely white feather in their upper tail coverts versus a very small spot that's on the Bermuda petrel tail. So um, once, if you see a black cap petrel well, you can always tell that that's what it is, even at a distance. But occasionally you might have, um, you might catch your breath when you see one coming in in bad light behind the boat. So Faya's petrel is another gadfly petrel that we see offshore from Hatteras, not regularly like black cap petrels, but they're smaller than a black cap petrel, a little bit bigger than a Bermuda petrel. But again, you could have that same type of confusion because in general, they're gray above. Um, they have a little bit more dark around their eye and their face. They have this nice small bill. Uh, they have a pale upper tail instead of a white upper tail and instead of that horseshoe shape but um, 
that you can't always see that uh, very well at every, you know, um, you can't always see that very well. Uh, sometimes their upper tails can look variable when you're at sea. Uh, but as soon as a Fayez petrel banks, you can see they have these dark underwings. So there is another flying field mark for you. Um, if you see a dark gadfly petrel that you think might be a Bermuda petrel, and then they bank and you see the black and the underwings, uh, you know that that's a Fayez petrel. So here's my pie in the sky, but uh, I've, I've seen Zeno's petrels um, in the field and they are very reminiscent of Bermuda petrels. They're very similar in size and shape. They fly in a similar fashion. Um, there's only one record here, but that doesn't mean we couldn't see one and you couldn't have some confusion. Um, so here is the dorsal of a Zeno's petrel. Again, the Zeno's petrels have these dark underwings, similar to Fea's petrels, but they're much more variable in the amount of white in their underwings. Um, you can see that face looks very reminiscent of a Bermuda petrel. So someday I'll have this problem. Someday some of us will have this problem, right? Uh, so I wanted to include a quick video. Hopefully this will play okay for you guys. Um, but it's just of some Bermuda petrels at sea so that you can see we've gone over these identification characteristics. Um, now you can see them in flight. Uh, they're much more buoyant than our black hat petrels, if any of you have seen black hat petrels with us offshore from Hatteras. Um, but you can see that sort of gray upper part and that white around the bill. Um, yeah, nice white underparts. And they don't get quite as, so when black hat petrels are flying, they're very dynamic and they'll sometimes get perpendicular to the horizon. Bermuda petrels kind of hang, they don't get quite as, they don't turn quite as sharply as black hat petrels do. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is your training for, for when you're offshore with us and we, we see one. Just never, never fails to um, make me pretty excited, so. Anyhow, that was taken by a friend of mine, Robert Flood um, in Bermuda. So now we're gonna start with the history of this incredible species. Um, Bermuda in the 1500s um, was of course an island and there were Spanish sailors all over the Atlantic um, that dropped, they would provision themselves by dropping hogs on different islands. Um, Bermuda had a population of probably close to a million cahows then, a million Bermuda petrels. Um, and they usually came in at night and they made these unearthly sounds. So they never settled there, but they did drop hogs there to provision themselves as they were traveling. Those hogs trampled the burrows of the Bermuda petrels. Uh, they ate the chicks, they ate the eggs, they ate the adults. And then when settlers did finally come in the 1600s, it was actually originally a shipwreck. Um, you can see they were coming to um, North America. They wrecked in Bermuda in a storm and the people ended up eating Bermuda petrels um, because they were starving to death. And uh, they brought with them cats, dogs, rats, other mammalian invasive species that basically eradicated these birds. In the 1620s, the governor of Bermuda issued a decree um, asking people to stop um, killing them and eating them. It was actually one of the first conservation measures. Um, but unfortunately, in 1621, the last Bermuda petrels were seen alive. Um, I included this map because I thought it was, I always find it incredible that people could map all of these locations even back then. So this is the first map that was ever drawn of Bermuda. So this in the background here, these are some islands where Bermuda petrels nest, uh, Castle Harbor Islands. Um, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the history. So in 1906, Louis L. Malbray, who was the curator at the Bermuda Museum and Zoo, um, he found a bird and it was wrecked and it ended up dying and he didn't know what it was. He knew it was a seabird. Um, he sent it off to um, 
the American Museum of Natural History, where later, many years later, it was identified as a Bermuda petrel. There were two more species, two more specimens that were found in 1935 and 1945, uh, both of which also were sent to the American Museum of Natural History um, to Robert Cushman Murphy, who, if you're not familiar with him, is um, an incredible, um, pre well, he, he discovered and um, wrote about a number of seabird species and their natural history. So he was intrigued by these findings. And in 1951, he organized an expedition to Bermuda to see if he could find the, the Bermuda petrel. And this, so David Wingate, um, who was a 15 year old boy at the time of this rediscovery, he was lucky enough to skip school that day and be with um, Murphy and Malbray on this expedition. And every time he tells this story, he says, oh, and I, I'll never forget, by God, it's the cacao. And it was a really exciting thing. There were actually newspaper articles and the rediscovery was a, it was a big deal. Um, David Wingate at that time decided, you know, as a 15 year old boy, um, he decided to dedicate his life to bringing this bird back from extinction. Um, so I just wanted to point out a couple of the islets where they found the location where they found that very first Bermuda petrel was here on Inner Pear Rock. Um, this is again Castle Harbor, which I pointed out in the very first map of Bermuda. Um, but these little islets in red are the only places that they were surviving when they were rediscovered. And here's a photograph. Um, this isn't the, the, uh, that original island, but you can get a feeling for how low lying these islets are where these birds um, were found remaining. And just a couple more incredibly historical photos um, of the dorsal surface of the Bermuda petrel. So as we, we discussed, you can see that um, sort of white horseshoe shape and the hooded appearance with the white around the bill. Um, and then the ventral surface, it's just pretty amazing. Um, so we're gonna check out another map of Bermuda just to bring us back to where we are working. Um, we're gonna be right here on this small island called Nunsuch. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna start uh, with David Wingate. So the boy who was 15 when these birds were rediscovered decided to dedicate his life to bringing them back from extinction. Um, he went back to, he went to university at Cornell and returned to Bermuda and he was made the first conservation officer of Bermuda. Uh, what you can see here in this image, this is none such island. There were no Bermuda petrels nesting on this island, um, but he was able to convince the government to give him this island to return it to its natural state in hopes that someday Bermuda petrels would nest there. Um, a couple of the other nesting islets you can see right here. This is Horn Rock um, and Southampton Island. So as I was saying, he wanted to take Nunsuch Island back to its original state. Uh, Bermuda had been taken over by a number of invasive species, you know, not just the mammals and humans that helped to eradicate the Bermuda petrel in the beginning, but there were a number of plant species, native plant species were just about gone on most of the main islands. Um, so David Wingate took the, those first 20 or 30 years um, getting rid of invasive plant species on Nunsuch and returning the native species there, eradicating rats on the island, um, trying to turn it back in to a suitable habitat for, for Bermuda petrels. Uh, so they started watching the birds from the time they were rediscovered in 1951. So all of the nesting cavities that they found, they kept track of and they were trying to see what the reproductive success was. Um, hardly any chicks were surviving to fledge and they couldn't figure out why. And um, they found the culprit after uh, the first two seasons, white-tailed tropic birds, which are pretty exciting species for us to see offshore from Hatteras as well. 
uh, also nest in Bermuda. Uh, they nest in some of the same locations that the Bermuda petrels do. And they were actually coming back to nest before the chicks fledged and they would remove, they would kill and remove the chicks from the burrows. Um, so Bermuda petrels really didn't have much of a chance. They were smaller than the tropic birds um, and they had to use these same burrows because they didn't have any other suitable nesting areas. Uh, so David Wingate devised these baffles. So you can see these wooden covers here. Um, he had They have wooden covers that fit on every single burrow, um, on every nesting islet for um, every cacao, every Bermuda petrel. Um, and what it does is this hole is big enough for the Bermuda petrel to come and go. Um, but not big enough for the tropic birds to get in there. Uh, so this, after 1962, which is when he was able to get them on all of the burrows, uh, there was not another uh, cacao chick lost to predation by white-tailed tropic birds. Uh, he also initiated a rat eradication program. Uh, so they were able to remove rats from all of the islands where these birds were nesting. And that was another huge step towards allowing them to at least be able to reproduce themselves. So as I was saying, they didn't have a lot of suitable nesting locations. Um, so they're nesting on these low lying islets and they're actually nesting in the rocks in crevices in the rocks. Uh, Bermuda petrels would normally be burrowing, digging their own burrows in the soil. Uh, but because most of the native plant species had been wiped out and they weren't able to be on the mainland um, because they'd been eradicated and pushed out by humans and development, um, they were, they had kind of resorted to nesting in the, you know, in places where they could make it through, but um, not totally suitable nesting locations. So David Wingate devised artificial nesting burrows for these birds. Uh, you can see here there's a long tunnel and then a cavity. So the nesting cavity is in the back. Um, they have to have complete darkness to nest. Uh, so it took a little while to figure out exactly what the dimensions needed to be. But each of the burrows is like 600 pounds of, of concrete. So if you can imagine um, lugging concrete to all of these islands to make these nesting burrows for these birds, um, they took to them right away. Uh, so this was incredibly helpful um, in allowing them to increase their population. And it was also incredibly helpful for David Wingate to be able to observe all of the nesting pairs, um, the eggs, the chicks. Um, he didn't handle them but he was able to keep track of all of the nesting pairs that he, that he had. So even though we were up to 18 pairs, it doesn't seem like many, 18 pairs in the, in the 1960s, there were still a number of issues. Um, DDT, which was not used in Bermuda, but was used in the US, uh, was an issue. They had a number of uh, chicks that didn't make it to even hatching because of issues with the eggshell, which is something we also know about in the US. Um, but as that was um, outlawed, the Bermuda petrels came back from that, uh, were able to recover the same way that many of our species here were. Um, predation was a problem. This is an interesting issue. So this photograph was taken by Brian Pattison in Bermuda. They had a snowy owl there. Um, that's not something you would normally see in Bermuda. It'd be an exciting thing to see, um, but it was killing the Bermuda petrels. And so David Wingate did um, shoot that snowy owl, but this is an image just of four of the Bermuda petrels that that owl killed. Um, light pollution is an issue for chicks that are fledging. Uh, the, the Castle Harbor col colonies are close to the airport and another army base. Uh, so that was an issue that they were able to work with the government on. Um, but hurricanes, uh, we know about those here on the coast. I imagine you guys uh, have your share of um, storms like that that move throughout there as well. But um, because all of these islets are so low lying, they're inundated during hurricanes. And also because these birds are nesting in these, it's basically like Swiss cheese, the rocks there. And with each storm, the storm surge is destroying these islets. Uh, 
slowly but surely and sooner or later they won't have anywhere to nest. So it's imperative um, to do everything that we can to help them survive into the future. So what ties us to Bermuda is because the first Bermuda petrels at sea were seen offshore from the Carolinas. Um, so Bermuda is here and Cape Hatteras here. It's about 626 miles between the two. So we're the closest point of land also to Bermuda. Um, Dave Lee, who is a curator at the State Museum here in North Carolina, some of you may have known him or known of him. Um, he saw that had the first Bermuda petrel in 1983, and it was southeast of Oregon Inlet. Um, and then there were two sightings on the same day, which still blows my mind a little bit. Uh, one was on a research vessel from South Carolina, um, and another on a pelagic trip, uh, for also from Oregon Inlet. Um, on July 31st, 1993. Of course, uh, my partner, Brian Pattison, was one of the people who saw those birds, saw one of the birds in 1993 and also Ned Brinkley. Um, and then Todd Haas was doing his PhD work on black hat petrels and he was on the research vessel. Uh, so the three of them, after seeing these birds at sea, they knew that was what they probably were. Um, but they didn't see all of the diagnostic characteristics that they expected to see. So they thought, oh, we'll go to Bermuda and we'll ask David Wingate how we identify these birds at sea. Um, so they took a trip to Bermuda in 1993. Um, and even though David Wingate said he couldn't help them, <laughs> It's not that he couldn't help them, but he'd never seen one at sea either. Uh, so he'd only had them coming to and from the colony at night and he'd seen them in the burrows. Um, so he was just as intrigued as uh, Brian and Ned and Todd were. Um, and he also took them on tours out to the islands and the four of them got together and started discussing this. Um, and they organized some trips to go to sea to look for Bermuda petrels around the nesting islands. Um, so this was in November, 1993. The birds are returning to court and mate in November. Um, and we'll go through the rest of their schedule as we go, but uh, they finally got to see the first Bermuda petrel in the daytime um, at sea near Bermuda back in 1993. So here in the center is David Wingate on the trip that he organized. Um, this is the house there at Nunsuch with David Wingate and Ned Brinkley. This porch still looks exactly the same <laughs> even today. Um, so in between the publication of their identification criteria um, and their visit to Bermuda, uh, Brian Pattison photographed the first Bermuda petrel for North America. It was actually the first photograph of a Bermuda petrel at sea. This was May 26, 1996. Um, I pulled this from the birding article that came out in 1998. It was authored by David Wingate, Todd Haas, Ned Brinkley, and Brian Pattison. Um, and it included this incredible photograph of a Bermuda petrel at sea from Hatteras, North Carolina. Uh, down here is a photograph that Ned Brinkley took on that trip in 93 of Nunsuch Island. So uh, David Wingate retired in 2001. He had a protege named Jeremy Medeiros, uh, who is still the senior terrestrial conservation officer in Bermuda. Um, there were 55 pairs of Bermuda petrels by the time that Jeremy took over from David Wingate. Uh, and he'd been working with David for 17 years leading up to this point. So um, here you can see Jeremy and a, a young Cahal, a young Bermuda petrel. Uh, so Jeremy did things a little bit differently and he also did some things the same as David Wingate did. Uh, as you can see here on the right, it's a picture of a Bermuda petrel receiving a band, an identification band. Most of you are probably familiar with that. Um, as I said before, David Wingate didn't handle the birds. Um, he was really afraid that the loss of even one Bermuda petrel would be too much and he didn't want to be responsible for that. Um, so he didn't have, he had a pretty hands off policy. Jeremy did some research and he found that you can safely handle seabirds. Um, so he began banding all of the individuals that they had there in, in, in the, on the, um, in Bermuda and Castle Har on the Castle Harbor Islands. 
Um, he continued with the rat eradication program. He also continued with the artificial nesting burrows. Um, this is a prototype of a, a new plastic lighter weight um, burrow that the Bermuda Audubon Society um, provided for them. And one of the main things that he did, which is still just amazing, it's a makes this all a conservation success story is he initiated a translocation program. So what does that mean? Um, he was able to take Bermuda petrel chicks from some of these low lying islets and translocate them to Nunsuch. So he created a colony on Nunsuch Island um, and they would take Bermuda petrels about 18 days, 20, 18 days before they fledged, uh, take them from the burrows, move them over to Nunsuch, hand feed them until they're ready to go. Um, and from 2004 to 2008, they translocated 105 chicks. Uh, 102 of those fledged successfully. And in 2008, four chicks returned, uh, courting and checking out the, the burrows. Um, and in 2009, the first um, Bermuda petrel chick was hatched on Nunsuch Island, which is just like, it still makes me a little teary eyed. Anyhow, so just to imagine, um, taking on this project and not knowing um, if what you're doing is, is going to work or not work. And then the feeling you have when you have successfully um, introduced a species. So the reason this works is because these birds exhibit phylopatry, which means that the males will return to the place from which they fledge. Uh, the males do so with about 80% accuracy Females don't have a strong bond like that, so they will um, typically take up with a male and move into a burrow of his choosing. So here are some pictures of some of the chicks that they translocated. Um, you know, Jeremy had to feed them. They fed them a number of times every day. Uh, so here you can see a picture of him feeding him some anchovies, um, exercising the wings. You can see the down. Um, and like I said, it was usually uh, 20 days prior to fledging. This is a photograph that Jeremy took of one of those chicks exercising its wings uh, before it fledges. You can see in the background that baffle on its nest um, and you can see it still has some of its down. Um, but what, what they'll do is for a number of evenings before they do fledge, they come out and they exercise their wings and they get strong enough um, and they also imprint themselves on their on the night sky, they're smelling their surroundings, um, preparing themselves to be gone for four years before they return to look for a mate and uh, begin breeding. So a couple of other things that Jeremy did is he initiated uh, a few projects to look into the North Atlantic range of the Bermuda petrel. Um, so he used these, this one is a geolocator a, or a data logger. I'm not sure which, but it was one of the first ones they used in 2009. Uh, this is a track from just one individual bird. So these tags were on for a full year. They were able to tag 12 individuals. Um, and as you can see, they have this broken down by month over here. Uh, most of the time during the nesting season, uh, they're around Bermuda, but also up here to the north on the, uh, you know, along the continental shelf edge offshore of New England and Canada. Um, and then in the off season, they're over here on the other side of the Atlantic around the Azores and Madeira, um, which we never knew before. So it's just incredible. Another thing that they did in 2019, and they've actually been doing it, um, they've actually been doing a number of projects where they're checking to see where the adults are going when they're foraging. Uh, but this is GPS tag of the very first um, foraging trip that they were able to record a single trip for a female cacao or a female Bermuda petrel. Um, it only took her seven days, but she went all the way up here to the colder, more productive water that's north of the Gulf Stream. We didn't know that they would do that um, when they were foraging for their young. We had assumed that they would stay closer to Bermuda. So this is kind of a game changer, um, just finding out what their range is and learning more about their natural history. Um, the furthest foraging trip I think that Jeremy mentioned was it was 
4,500 or 5,000 miles, which is in, in, you know, usually between eight and 12 days they would take to go feed and then come back to feed their chick. So I wanted to take you guys back to the colony map so we can look again at those initial um, islets where they were found nesting. And you can see here, the, these are the translocation colonies on Nunsuch Island. Um, Southampton Island, which we saw back in the beginning in that first aerial photo of Nunsuch, um, they have just started nesting on that island. I think it was the 2012-2013 um, season, the Bermuda petrels uh, started nesting there themselves. No one translocated them, no one moved them, um, but there are enough birds now that they're starting to find different locations to nest. So if you're an ecologist, <laughs> this is a pretty awesome curve here. We have the, the years across the bottom here on the x-axis. So starting in 1962 and going to 2019. Um, and here on the y-axis, we have the number of breeding pairs. Uh, so the blue is the number of pairs. That's the nesting pairs, the adults. Um, and in orange, you have the chicks that fledged um, each season. So as you can see, like we're, we're in that part of the curve where they're having some nice exponential growth. And um, Jeremy's goal was just to have 100 pairs, you know, before he finished. And we reached that um, almost 10 years ago. So Nunsuch Island has been uh, dedicated as a, a living museum by Bermuda. Um, Jeremy leads tours there. So the tours that I lead in, in November with Bob Flood, we get to take groups out there um, and do banding studies with Jeremy. So he allows us to um, see the birds in the hand, which is uh, really an amazing treat and photograph them. So here you can see, uh, this is actually one of, this is a male, it has like a little bit of a bigger bill and kind of a blocky head there. But education is key to conservation. Um, so in addition to allowing groups like ours to travel to Bermuda, uh, Jeremy has uh, schools, local school groups coming out to Nunsuch all the time um, to see what he's doing with the native plant species, to see how Bermuda petrels fit into um, that entire natural history um, of the island. So um, since they would normally be burrowing, they're contributing to the health of the plant species. And until you put all of those pieces together, um, you can't really see how it can take off. Uh, and now they're able to really start to see that in Bermuda. Huh. Um, so I wanted to give you guys um, to end up on the current status of the Bermuda petrels. So currently on Nunsuch, uh, there are 26 nesting pairs, which is up from 23 last nesting season. So far, 13 chicks have hatched on Nunsuch and at least 50 chicks from the other colonies. Uh, there are 142 nesting pairs this year, which is amazing. Uh, when we started this talk at like seven or eight pairs in 1951, which was 70 years ago this February that they were rediscovered. Um, so a few more ways that we educate people about Bermuda petrels, and I can give information about this to anyone who's interested, um, but Cornell has a cahau cam. Uh, now they're up to two nests. One of the nests this year um, didn't produce an egg, which is normal for Bermuda petrels. They usually, it's about a 50% success rate. So that would be a year on, a year off. Um, but the Cajal Cam 2, um, they've produced a chick, I think it's like every year for the last 12 years, or maybe they've missed one year in the last, um, anyhow, it's, it's a, it's, they're, they do an incredible job. They're super, super, superheroes in the in the breeding in the breeding realm. But this year, the chick hatched out on March 9th. So typically, like I mentioned before, the birds are courting in November. Um, they leave in December to feed. They lay their egg in January, and that egg hatches in March. Uh, after that, the parents are kind of absent. The chicks are pretty precocious. Uh, they have everything they need. The parents just come and go and feed them. Um, and then they stop feeding them about a week before they would fledge. Um, but here you can see this is just a couple hours after the 
chick hatched. Um, another really cool finding this year on Nunsuch um, down here is the very first Kahau Cam chick who was named Shadow. Um, and it fledged in June of 2017. Uh, Jeremy found this chick in a burrow, found this chick as an adult now, but in a burrow this year with an unbanded female. So that bird recruited a female from another colony um, and now they're nesting there and none such. And so there are two translocation colonies um, and we're on our way to success. And um, thank you guys for having me because <laughs> um, now I have this many more people that have been educated about Bermuda petrels and might have questions and um, just can be passionate about their story and their survival. Um, I just wanted to I list out my acknowledgements. Uh, David and Jeremy are both really close friends of mine. Um, Ned Brinkley, we wrote the Bermuda petrel account for Birds of the World. Um, and then Robert Flood, of course, I lead tours with him and, and a lot of other people who help make it possible for me to um, get to Bermuda and take pictures like this, <laughs> hold a cahow, spend time with cahows. Um, anyhow, there's a lot of information out there on them. This is just a little bit that I use to prepare this talk for you guys. Um, and then just if anyone had any questions, hopefully I was somewhere within our time span there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate. I think we do have a few questions. Um, let's see, uh, Natasha, are you going to read the ones that we have here on um, on Zoom, please? Um, sure. Uh, so let's see. The first one. It was Matthew. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, Matthew wants to know: Do they always have just one chick per pair? Okay, yes, they do. Uh, and they don't lay an extra egg if they fail. Um, so what they'll do is they'll, they'll usually take a year off because they need that and it's more energetically um, beneficial for them to do that. But yes, just one egg and one chick. So they're a very slow reproducing species, which is another reason um, why it's so important to do all that we can to help them to build their population. Okay. Um, Malia asks, so on the 700 mile one-way foraging trip, why did the Bermuda petrel fly at 22 miles per hour up and 45 miles per hour back? So that has to do with using the wind. Um, so a lot of times if they're flying into the wind, it will take them a little bit longer to get somewhere. And if they can use a tailwind, um, it will cause them to move a little bit faster. Um, and the, it's like, it's pretty amazing how far some of these birds can travel um, if they have the right conditions. Okay. Um, Jeff Turner asks, when do they sleep and how much of the day do they sleep? Um, so these birds and a number of seabirds, it's kind of interesting. They will, they sleep on the wing um, and I don't, I'm not sure if there are other species that do that, but there might be. Um, I know um, what they'll do is they'll just sort of turn off, ha they'll rest half of their brain while they're still flying. Um, and so they don't like go to sleep the way that we do. You'll see them a lot of times when they're nesting. Um, they will, they'll sleep when they're in the burrow. Um, and the pair, when they come back um, to, to mate, they'll spend you know, a week or two, most of that time will be sleeping during the day and then going out and foraging at night. So hopefully that answers the question. They don't sleep the way that you expect them to sleep. Okay. Um, Martina asks, what dictates nest site, nest site selection? As in, is it the male or female that returns to where it was hatched? So it'll be the, the male is typically the one that exhibits a stronger site fidelity, if that makes sense. So about 80% of males will return to from where they fledged. So in, in the translocation colony, when Jeremy had those chicks that fledged in 2004, between 2004 and 2008, um, the first chicks that came back return to within five feet of where they fledged. And what's even more amazing is once they mate, so they mate for life, the pairs will, the pairs 
the two individuals and the pair will usually return to that nest within hours of one another. And they haven't been together for since last year. You know, um, it's just all of it is kind of mind blowing to me. Uh, some of the some of the chicks tried to use their same burrows that they fledged from, and others uh, came back and are nesting just a few feet away from where they fledged. Wow, that's amazing uh, to me. <laughs> uh, William Anderson asks, uh, "What about their life at sea?" So. As much as we know about their, so let's see, there are a couple of things. So we could say most of the time when they're nesting and providing for their chicks, um, they're foraging. So they're making foraging runs. So they're going to highly productive areas and feeding and then bringing back as, as much food as they can for their chick. And the male and female both participate in that. Um, so they'll take turns. Actually, I don't know that they, um, you know, sometimes you'll see the chicks will be fed twice in a night by both parents. Um, uh, but more often than not, when they're not nesting, they're just spending their time at sea, um, traveling and traveling to productive areas for feeding. Um, and so like you could see on that one track that was just one bird over a year, um, some of those productive areas are further north than we imagined. So they have been seen like off of Ireland um, and, and a number now up off of New England, um, but it's that highly productive water that's kind of north of the Gulf Stream. And then some also will feed here um, on the shelf break where we have some productive waters offshore here as well. But it's mostly food related where you'll find them. Okay. If that answer, hopefully um, that answers the question. If not, you can always email me. Uh, Matthew asks, are all the chicks banded or just the ones on none such? Um, so this is a pretty a big number when I say it, but Jeremy has banded like 626 Bermuda petrels um, since he started banding in 2001. Um, the survival rate for the chicks is like 30% that they'll survive their first four years at sea and come back to nest. Um, he bans every chick and he bans every adult that's in a nesting cavity that he can get to. So he actually visits every single nesting site on all of the nesting islands um, twice a week. It's, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but it sounds that way. Um, Christine asks, is it hard to book a trip uh, a tour trip during baby season, what month would you recommend going to see them at Nonesuch? So um, I'm not sure about when the chicks are out. I mean, I'm not sure about the fledging season or like when the chicks are hatched because I haven't been there at that time of year. Um, we usually go in the, when they're courting and mating. So it's before they lay their egg. Um, and it's a really slow time in Bermuda, so it's pretty easy to see them then. And you can actually see them from land. Um, there's a place called Cooper's Point in Bermuda. You can set up a scope and look at the ocean at dusk and you can see pairs courting offshore um, or Bermuda Audubon organizes trips offshore to see them during those months as well. Uh, Cause that's when you would be able to see the adults. Um, if you wanted to do a tour out at Nunsuch during the time when the chicks are there, I would just email Jeremy. They have a, they actually have a website, Nunsuch Expeditions, um, that you could check and they actually have information about the different tours that they offer there. Okay. Um, Gretchen asks, how long do they live? They can live for 30 to 40 years. Uh, as yeah. far as we know, some of them might live longer than that. Um, I don't know if any of you follow seabirds, but there's an, an albatross uh, who is, I think she's 73, or at least she was banded 73 years ago, just hatched a chick um, in the Pacific. So seabirds are very long lived, um, which is why probably one of the reasons why these birds were able to survive unnoticed for so long, um, because it doesn't take many to, to continue that, um, continue the species. Okay. 
Um, Christine says, um, I know puffins off of Maine struggle when the waters are too warm for their primary food source. Uh, is climate change uh, pushing these birds uh, to different waters for food? So, well? th um, so that would be something that we don't totally know yet. Um, since the first tracks for them were in 2009, um, the bigger issue for these birds is um, hurricanes because the storms are more severe and they're coming later in the season. Uh, sometimes they might overlap with their nesting season. Uh, so from that perspective, climate change is a, a very big deal for them. Um, but it could be that we see, you know, I don't know that they're as limited um, in the distances that they can travel. So I would hope that they would be able to find food um, irregardless of where it might be. And I know the last couple of years, they've been doing some tagging projects where they're uh, tagging the adults to see where they're foraging. Um, I don't know that they're thinking as much about the long-term, like when they're not providing for their chicks, which would be the same thing with puffins, of course, providing for their chicks. Um, but what they found, especially in the last two years, is that, is that they've been foraging very close to Bermuda um, and they've been having more success, which you can tell in the weights of the chicks because Jeremy is um, measuring them all the time, of course, checking on them all. Um, so it's pretty, pretty interesting. But of course, you know, there have been years uh, leading up to this where the parents were having to travel for long periods and not bringing back as much food for the chicks. So it just depends. And I think that's a really big question that we're gonna see um, moving into the future, especially with seabirds, um, trying to figure all of that out. I know there are going to be a number of species that are going to be very negatively impacted by not only climate change, but human use of fisheries. Um, Gretchen asks, do they dive for fish like gannets? No, they'll actually, as far as we know, okay, because um, nobody really watches them feeding in the same in the same way that we get to see gannets feeding. Um, what we assume from putting data loggers on them that will track the where they are, if they're above the surface or below the surface, like if their legs are in the water or if they're flying. Um, for this genus, uh, I couldn't say for Bermuda petrels specifically, but most of the time they're feeding more on the surface. Um, so a lot of them will be feeding at night and they're feeding on species that come up at night, um, you know, specifically squid and other species of zooplankton that go through this migration. Um, at night, they're coming up to the surface and during the day they're going down, a lot of those are bioluminescent and they think that that's attractive to the gadfly petrels. But um, as far as we know, like black cat petrels feed mostly on squid and fish. Um, and they're not really physically equipped to dive in the same way that shearwaters do. So mostly it would be a very shallow dive if they did dive. Um, if that, hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Uh, and Matthew asks, are there genetic diversity issues resulting from the population? Ah, getting this so question, close? this is the, I was wondering if anyone would ask about that because of course we have bottleneck um, anyhow, I know that they've done some genetic analysis on these birds, but I haven't seen any information from that. Um, I have those same questions, but I also, you know, it's also possible that there were a lot more of them than we knew when they were rediscovered. Uh, since they're so long lived, a number of them could have been at sea. So we, we really don't know what they were down to. and. We just have to hope that um, whatever happens with them, that they have have the genetic diversity to survive the struggles of the future. And it's interesting, you know, Jeremy was, um, you know, he talks a lot about this and sometimes that's a way to, that you have sort of a divergent evolution. So you might have some large petrels that survive and some small ones, and they're only going to breed with each other. And you could split off and have uh, two different species. Not that that's necessarily happening here, but it's interesting the way that it works. And um, it's always in, it's always in progress, which is, you know, I think about it a lot with our black cat petrels too. So, oh, so hopefully Matthew. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I make a quick says, comment? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. This is basically, I got this book randomly. Um, really? I, it's the best book. Yeah, Rare Birds, and it's all of, about um, the the cows. I picked it up, I don't know if any of you guys shop at Ollie's, which is just like the random Here bargain. Here you go. Um, yeah, oh yeah, this is a fantastic book. That's, that's- um, Good in my- That's David, isn't David. it? David Wingate. But mm -hmm. it's by Elizabeth yeah. German. And, his, and they gave him a little Boston Wheeler. Yeah, it's so this is basically like Kate's whole presentation, but if you wanted to read about it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And it's way better written than my presentation. So oh, no, I, by the seat of my pants most of the time. I'm a visual learner. I like this better. <laughs> oh, that was so good, Kate. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, I think it was a good story about a species rising from adversity for us right now. Um, since we've all been in trying times, but um, you know, it really does point to individual dedication. I mean, the people who did the banding and the feeding and you know, all of that. So yeah, yeah all, all good to keep I think in just mind. Just one person, just right. one person can make a difference. That's like the most important thing to take away. Education, educating people about things and that everyone can make a difference. It's amazing, yeah. Good. Do you want us to, you, do you want to mention seabirding to us just for oh, a second? Oh yeah. So, uh -huh. so if anyone wanted to get in touch with me or had any more questions, um, the company I work for is Seabirding and we have a website that's just seabirding.com. You should be able to find it. Um, all of the contact information on there is for me. Uh, it doesn't say that, but you might be able to figure out that the email address is Kahal. <laughs> you might know that it, that it, it could be me anyhow. Uh, the phone number, email address, feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions. And we hopefully Matthew will get to see a Bermuda petrel. This is like, you know, his training here <laughs> in May. I'm, I'm hoping big time. <laughs> <laughs> now oh. you know what to look for. So yeah, I, I yeah, expect good helpful. things from you. <laughs> oh gosh, that was, again, that was, uh, so good and uh, it was an honor to have you with us Kate. you did a really good job and um i know you want to go get a drink of water so <laughs> oh no i was i had i had tons of water just in case but my voice i didn't lose it at all so we're good, good. Excellent. excellent thank you guys so much for the opportunity oh you're welcome oh, you're thank welcome. you thank you and if you know of anybody who wants to watch this of course it was recorded and it will be on metbirds.org um Whenever Judy gets it up, unfortunately, she couldn't be with us tonight, but we struggled along without her. So yeah. I think you watch the recording and um, uh, we hope to see everybody back on May 6th for the talk about painted buntings. Um, so anyway, I guess we'll we'll chat a little more if you'd like. If anybody has questions um, for Christine or anybody else about Global Big Day or the North Carolina Bird Atlas, um, feel free to stay on and uh chat some more or if everybody's sleepy and wants to go to bed <laughs> that's fine too so don't forget to keep the pictures coming I love sharing them with everybody I think it's great to see what everybody's up to and what they saw so um, good yeah it makes a big difference to have have pictures and um, um, I thought it was a great meeting anybody else have any comments so it looks like you're all muted anyway so <laughs> It's a good time to uh, say good night and um, yeah, good night and good burning. That's the way we'll leave it and uh, have a great uh, weekend and a, and a good holiday. Thanks so much. Bye, Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks, awesome. Kate. Have a good Thanks, weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.